18, verses 9 through 14. You'll find us on page 81 of the New Testament section of your pew Bible. We will read together. On the surface, this seems very simple. God condemns the proud, but God justifies the humble. But there's more to it than that. We good church people expect God to love us no matter what we do. But when we consider other people, we sometimes put conditions on them. If they repent, if they change their ways, then maybe God will forgive them. But notice that the guilty tax collector does not put his tithe into the offering plate. He doesn't pour out his heart. He doesn't promise to change his ways even. He just admits that he's a low life and he begs God's mercy. And he goes home justified. He's not justified because of anything he does, but because it's God's good will to forgive and to accept the man. The Pharisee points to the tax collector to say, thank goodness I'm not like him. But in truth, we all need God's mercy. We are all forgiven and justified by God's grace. Not because of any of us is better than another, but because God is so unreasonably generous and loving and compassionate. The tax collector and the Pharisee and us are justified. Let us read together Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and rewarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, will not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who would exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here now our second reading, Psalm 65, which you will find in the Old Testament portion of your pew Bible on page 527. The psalmist giving thanks to God for all the beauty and the, and the bounty of the earth. And he acknowledges God as the source of all the blessings. And he acknowledges the goodness of life when you're in relationship with God and when God delivers you through all your travails. Note the references to God's power evidenced in nature. Mountains, oceans, mighty waters, wilderness, meadows. Such forces humble the psalmist who recognizes and acknowledges God's greatness, how insignificant he is. Think of the tax collector in Luke's gospel who humbled himself before God's glory and then realized his own unworthiness. Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed, O you who answer prayer. To you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with deliverance, O God of salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength you establish the mountains. You are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the people. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for you have so prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. 
Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow, and the hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows cloak themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. The word of the Lord. A Hindu priest, a Jewish rabbi, and a TV evangelist are caught in a terrible thunderstorm and they seek shelter at a farm. And the farmer says, well, yeah, you can stay here for the night, but the problem is there's only room enough for two of you. So one will have to sleep in the barn. I'll go, said the Hindu priest. Little hardships, nothing to me. So he went out to the barn. A few minutes later, it's the Hindu. I'm sorry, but, but there's a cow in the barn. And in my religion, cows are sacred, and, and I must not intrude on their sacred space. No problem, said the rabbi, come in. I'll, I'll go stay out there. A few minutes later. I hate to be a bother, the rabbi said, but, but there's a pig in my barn. And in my religion, pigs are considered unclean, and I cannot share my quarters sleeping with a pig. Don't worry, said the evangelist. I'll go sleep in the barn. A few minutes later, it's the cow and the pig. <laughs> it's, it's an old joke. It's been told many a time. Really, on anybody, we feel superior. It's been told on preachers. It's been told on politicians. The Pharisees probably told the joke on TV evangelists and tax collectors. Thank God I'm not a gator. I'm a Seminole. Thank God, I'm not a Seminole, I'm a Gator. War Eagle, Roll Tide, pick your adversary. Who would you tell the joke on? Two men went up to the temple to pray, said Jesus. One a Pharisee, the other tax collectors. Oh, this, this ought to be good, this ought to be good. And then Jesus allows us to hear the two men's prayers. Thank God I'm not like all these other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers. Thank God I'm not like this tax collector. Now, I fast twice a week. I give my tithes every Sunday. I do everything I'm supposed to do. So prays the first man. And the other man, not even daring to look up to heaven. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, at first glance, we, we get the tone, we get the message. God condemns the proud and justifies the humble. God condemns the Pharisees' pride and he's so self-absorbed and self-congratulating. You cannot pray that egotistically and go home justified. But if you humbly acknowledge your sinfulness, God honors that, forgives you, makes you right, justifies you. But it's not that simple. With a second look, you start to get a little more of what's beneath the surface. One of my ministry colleagues, Stan Ott, who some of you have met through the years, and he's done things in our presbytery, he writes a blog, and he co-hosts a podcast called Building One Another. And this week, I emailed Stan and corresponded about his recent podcast, Give a Second Glance. When we say something about someone or some situation, I didn't give it a second glance, we suggest that nothing about the person or the situation was really worth taking note. It's just ordinary, doesn't have any impact on me, doesn't have any great situation, doesn't have any great, it doesn't even bother me enough to pay attention. Just move on. A first glance passes by somebody. A second glance engages, looks, lingers, takes in what's happening, cares enough to really notice and, and, and get engaged and find out what they're thinking, what they're experiencing. What, a second glance, oh. Stan Ott says Jesus gives the second glance. He gives some examples. Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. 
the paralyzed man lying by the pool of Bethesda, the woman who had bled for 12 years and dared to reach out and touch him as he walked by. He turned and looked at her. The Good Samaritan gave the man in the ditch a second glance, stopped, assessed it, helped. So Stan tells that he was visiting a church and during worship when they came to passing the peace, he turned to the lady behind him who took him by the hand and said, peace be with you. And before Stan could even say, and also with you, she was already looking past him to the next person she wanted to greet. He said, her eyes didn't even meet my eyes. She had already moved on. She had spoken the word of peace, but Stan said, I sure didn't feel very peaceful. I'd been overlooked. She hardly gave Stan a first glance, much less a second glance. She didn't even take the time to say, oh, and I'm glad to have you here, or peace be with you, or welcome. Just peace be with you, moving on. The second glance means I see you, I acknowledge you, I recognize you. I want to know more. I, I know you're more than just what meets the eye, more than what's on the surface. I, I really want to know you as a person, as a friend. I, I want to know your story. Because everybody's going through something, and we may just have something the other person needs to know. In personal relationships, at home, in a, in a church community, out in our greater community, in serving one another, in, in stewardship even. Giving the second glance means paying attention, and it's what blesses other people. Giving is more than the gift. It's also about the giver and your motive and your intent. Your thankfulness that prompts your generosity or you're getting involved, the way Sue said in the church, and, the, and, and taking part in getting to know more. So let's give the Pharisee and the tax collector a second glance. Jesus tells the parable to an audience that Luke describes in verse 9 as certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. The Pharisee. I mean, given the moral and ethical standards and the demands of the Jewish tradition, the Pharisee was quite right in performing what he did. He did fast. He did give. He did come to temple. He did pray. In his duties, he was not like the others, the extortioners, the adulterers, the, the unjust. And Jesus' hearers would indeed say, this, this man, he was indeed a righteous man. He hadn't spoken untrue. And the tax collector rightfully had nothing to commend him. He was unjust. He was crooked. He was the bad guy. He abused his own people by extorting more money than he deserved as a collector. And yet Jesus says he's the good guy. Probably confused his listeners. And Jesus did not mean that the Pharisee was wrong in his deeds of morality and his piety or that the tax collector was right for swindling his own people. So what's wrong? The Pharisee was wrong in his approach to God. He bragged, look how good I am, God. I'm doing everything you said to do. I'm virtuous, I'm moral. Compared to these guys, whew. and like the tax collector, I'm glad I'm not like him. Oh, what a good boy am I. The tax collector, however, knew he was a bad guy. He wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. He was too embarrassed. It said he just cried, God, God, be merciful. And he was accepted and went home justified simply because he threw himself on God's mercy. The Pharisee talked at God. The tax collector talked with God. The stewardship bulletins we're using addresses Luke 18, verse 14. All who humble themselves will be exalted. 
On the back of the insert, it says, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector is a stark reminder that our salvation, our justification, and our righteousness are completely the result of the work of Jesus Christ and only possible through the grace and mercy of God. As we go to be good stewards of God's name, we must remember this. The freedom grace affords us allows us to let go of the lie that we have earned what we have. The result is humble and a repentant heart that will be willing at times and in all things to give and to serve. It then goes on to say, Jesus, the parable challenges us to consider the motives of our stewardship and to avoid the trap of believing that our stewardship practices earn us any favor, any righteousness, or any part of our salvation. It was the man who had nothing to offer but his repentant heart that was justified before God. You know, at first glance, we, we just see two men in church. Then Jesus gives us a second glance when he lets us hear their prayers and know what's going on in their hearts and, and what they're thinking. Imagine if everybody in church knew what you were thinking today, knew the real you. We look on the outside of folks and, and make assumptions. God knows what's in our heart. Psalm 139, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my thoughts. Even before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. You know, at first glance, it's easy to see the Pharisee's pride and his arrogance. It's harder to see our own pride and arrogance. It's not easy to see that we hurt other people because of our pride At first glance, it's easy to see the tax collector's humility and we think, well, we're just as genuine. God forgive me too. We do not always recognize as easily that our sins cause problems for other people and it harms our relationship with other people and it even harms our relationship with God because the sin gets in the way and clutters things up. We do better to give ourselves a second glance and a bit of humble introspection. We do better giving others a second glance and a little grace as we deal with them. Problem is the Pharisee takes credit for his own goodness. He doesn't praise God, thank you for helping me to be good. Thank you for helping me to do what is right. Thank you for helping me to do what you expect, O God. He just pats himself on the back for how good he is. He prays to get recognition so that everybody around him hears, oh, see all the good things I'm doing? He doesn't really come to get closer to God, it seems. And how sad, because the more we pray with God, the closer we get to God. And the more we recognize God's goodness and how much we need God and how much God is there for us. The Pharisee didn't go to church to enter into communion with God. He went to parade his piety and go home feeling good about himself. At least that's my first glance. In contrast, the tax collector is far off, won't even come close to the people, just stands in the back and says, God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Jesus said, this man's humble humility, his his heartbroken, self-debasing prayer is what won him acceptance before God. God heard the Pharisee too, but God couldn't do anything with his prayer because the man's really not asking anything. He's just telling God. How sad. Because before God, we're not supposed to lift ourselves up above other people to to bring everybody else into relationship with God in our prayers and recognize that we too are one of the great ragtag army of sinning, suffering, selfish, sorrowing humanity. And so we pray for everyone else when we pray, kneeling to ask God's mercy, praying with and for everyone else. The Pharisee was a good man. He's not lying. He did fast. He did tithe his money. He was not as the others were. He was not a swindler. But the question is not, am I as good as other people? The 
question is, God, am I as good and compassionate and generous as you? In the stewardship season, let us consider our choices and our motives and our financial giving to the work of the church. I mean, do we sometimes echo the Pharisee going, you know, I'm just filling out the card because it's what you're supposed to do. It's the responsible thing to do. It's a good thing to do. Look, look how good I am. On second glance, do we recognize how fortunate we are because of God's goodness to us and say, God, thank you. Let me do the same to help others. Let me show you my thankfulness, and I want to give this. And I'd even love to give more, oh God, if I could. If I have money to share, I have talents to share, I have time to share, I could be a volunteer, I could do these things. Do we echo Psalm 65 and acknowledging, look at all these great gifts and the power and the beauty and the majesty you show us, O oh God, in your world and in our lives. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Do we have seasons that we're so appreciative of God and what it means to you and does for you that I would just give everything, God, if I could do more? It's a generous heart giving thanks. Please realize that giving is more than just the gift. It's about the intent. It's about the heart, the desire of the giver. God recognizes our sincere desire to do more, to give more, to offer more, and God accepts whatever we can bring as our thanks to our offering to God for his blessings to us. So we learn from both men in the parable. And maybe we'll put aside the idea that we would never behave like either of them or think too much of ourselves or too little of ourselves. I appreciate the faithful givers who give both diligence and responsibility and also show appreciation in their giving to God. So what happened to the two men when they went home, you think? What happens to us when we go home every Sunday? Luke's gospel doesn't tell us. Parables don't answer that question. They just raise a question that you have to resolve. I'd like to thank the Pharisee after giving second thoughts, after witnessing this tax collector's humble prayer. Maybe he went home and said, Lord, forgive me for judging that tax collector. Forgive me for, for judging all these other people. They're, they're, they're good people too. You promised to, ask for, to offer forgiveness for all those who ask God? Please forgive me too. I'd like to think that the tax collector went home and thought about it and prayed, Lord, I have cheated my neighbors. I've overtaxed them. I'll do my best to restore what I can and to be fair and honest with them. I'll try to be more like the Pharisee and do what is upstanding and right and moral. Oh God, would you help me to be honest from now on? Sometimes with a second glance, we discover who and what we are and what God can and does in us, how God is working in us. So I love the devotional thought from Evelyn Newman, a Christian writer. She was going through a troubled time in her life, and there was a little lake near her home, and she walked down. She liked to walk by the lake and think and pray, and one of the main things she did love to see was the the reflection of the trees on the other side of the lake. But on this day, it was windy, wavy, and there, and there really was no reflection, and it dawned on her, even God can't paint a picture of moving water. Sometimes you have to be still and humble yourself before God can bless you before you can see clearly what God is doing in you and wants to do through you. Time for a little introspection. Two men in church, one so busy self-congratulating, he really didn't acknowledge the source of all that was good in his life, and the other who just emptied his cup and God filled it anew. At first glance, giving is all about the gift. Second glance, giving is about yourself and your intent, your desire, your appreciation, your awareness of God at work in your life, and a desire to share blessings with others that they too may have that sense of God's presence. 
giving time, giving money, giving volunteerism, giving attention to other people, giving forgiveness to other people, giving another glance in response to God's grace. Thanks be to God. Lord, help us to give the second glance and a second chance. It's all that easy and all that hard. Thanks be to you, O God, for the goodness in our lives. In Christ our Lord. Amen.